Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the quick introduction. I'm actually extremely excited to be here today to share our journey as an IT organization and really how Linux, not only as a partner, but through a platform, has been a key enabler to our enterprise architecture practice, as well as how we've been able to start to envision closing the gap between planning and operations. Before doing so, I'd like to give you an introduction into Campari, who we are, our growth strategy, and a view of some of the amazing brands we have in our product portfolio. So, how best to do this than through some marketing material? So please sit back and enjoy this short video. So, if there's one key takeaway that I would ask you to ensure you have today is at drinks tonight, if you see any of those products, rest assured, I will do my best to make sure it offsets our Linux subscription. <laughs> so, as you saw, our growth strategy is built into two areas, 50% organic, 50% inorganic. And clearly, over the last few years, we've had a successful history of acquisitions. 27 up until 2018, and in the last quarter, we've confirmed to the public an additional three, which to many of you poses an issue similarly to us, is it's a constantly changing landscape. Just when we're completing a piece of standardization and everyone's about to high-five themselves, we've been able to get rid of an AS400. Next thing we know, there's another one on our doorstep. And I can tell you, at least the latest discovery, the new AS400 is sitting in St. Martinique in the Caribbean. So, whichever project team gets to work on that is clearly still half-fiving themselves. 
So really, before we start looking at closing the gap and planning and operations, it's taking a step back in time and looking at the start of our journey. And going back to 2017, now you might ask why that specific date. And the precursor was in Q4 2016, a new CIO or head of IT joined Campari. And that fundamentally triggered the rest of what we'll discuss in the next few slides. So, 2017, we've got a new CIO, and ultimately an organization that is based on service delivery. Enterprise architecture or architecture as a whole does not exist, the concept or the understanding. And ultimately, the CIO's vision is that we need to move away from service delivery and become true business partners. In order to do that, we really need to look at re-envisioning the entire IT organization, starting with vision and mission, but ultimately trying to understand what are our principles and behaviors that we as an IT organization wanted to stand by. And ultimately, this was the launch of our One IT Digital Business Services, where we wanted to focus on some of these different principles, but most notably building sustainable systems, as well as being secure. And we wanted to align those to architecture principles, a defined governance framework, as well as keeping security first in mind and protecting not only our data, but what we call our camperistas our end users. Now, in doing so, we started to actually understand and have discussions about how do we bring architecture or enterprise architecture into the company. And this is when we started to evaluate not just tooling, but the requirements around processes and people. And this was the first point in time that we had discussions with Linux. Now. Yes, there were many other tools out there, and we did do the evaluation, but Linux at that point in time really marketed themselves as the Google or Facebook of enterprise architecture, namely lightweight and easy to use. And being a first generation millennial, you can imagine I was loving life. So it wasn't just about a platform for architects, we are a small IT organization. It was really about what could we bring to IT that was going to provide value and co-creation of value, not to an enterprise architecture team, but to our center of expertise, and for them to be able to engage their business partners and actually have a different type of discussion. And really, this led to 2018, where the discussion needed to change. Up until that point in time, it was the business purchasing applications. It was the business deciding which applications they wanted to implement. IT was merely there to support that application. So we spent a considerable amount of time understanding how do we start changing that conversation to be capability-led. And this is where Linux really played a pivotal role for us in being able to sit with our larger wide IT organization and start discussions on what are the Campari capabilities that we need to be successful and support that strategy that you saw in the video earlier. Now, I've seen over the last few years numerous presentations where we've been able to focus around business capabilities for rationalization, understanding where we potentially we have applications that we can consolidate. But one of the key areas we noticed was it actually allowed our center of expertise, partnering with the business, to actually prioritize what capabilities we should be investing in and where we actually have white space. And for us, this is quite critical, primarily around the supply chain. We have plants, distilleries, and farms all over the world. The Caribbean is a chaos, and every single plant and farm has a different application and different hardware. 
So it's quite critical for us to look at how do we standardize that and really drive the PL through the use of applications. Now, 2018 was really pivotal in re-looking at our IT operating model. In order for us to be successful, we needed to envision an organization that is closer to the business. And in doing so, the decision was made to go to market to outsource a considerable part of our service delivery. Once again, Linux came into play. How better to capture information on all the applications than leveraging the survey functionality? I was just in a, one of the presentations earlier, and I have to say that if you have Linux, survey functionality is highly underrated. It is quite simple and easy to use to collect numerous amounts of data, but removing the silo effect whereby information that is pertinent to the life cycle of an application continues to live and breathe in the fact sheets. Now, closing out 2018, we ultimately have started that conversation around business capabilities with the business. We've commenced with an outsourcing RFP, but one of the key topics since our initial discussion with Linux was how do we get a forward-looking view into the technology and risk of our estate? Up until to date, we had a list of applications. We could understand where we wanted to rationalize. But if you ask me in one year's time what's going to break, I'll let you know when it happens. So fundamentally, this was always top of mind. 2019, to be honest, has been a year from hell. We completed our outsourcing, which is no easy task, but it provided us a great opportunity because one of the key decisions was to take our ServiceNow platform and build it from scratch. Up until that point in time, we had a very bespoke and custom implementation that was providing little value to both our end users as well as us to the internal IT organization. Now, in doing so, one of the key areas that we envisaged was how do we, through the rebuilding of our ServiceNow platform, take this opportunity to gain insights into our IT components, and through that, be able to give our center of expertise and potentially their business partners visibility into the risk that they have within their application portfolio and a forward-looking view on how best to plan projects, taking into consideration the need to upgrade and maintain specific components as well. So, that's up until today. Now, really, we need to look at how do we close the gap in planning and operations. Now, there's two tools or platforms in this area. On the one side, we have Linux. I think we're all here today. We've got quite a good understanding of what Linux does. Enterprise architecture management, primarily focused around APM, integration management, and quite critical technology and risk. On the other hand, we've got ServiceNow. And most of us see ServiceNow as a service management platform. But over the last few years, they've really looked to capture the holistic view of all the IT processes within that platform. So not only do we have service management, which captures the likes of incidents, problem, change, service request management, but you've got the likes of the IT business management that enables you to start looking at from the ideation through to project to your overall portfolio management. So, one, as I mentioned, being a smaller organization, we want to make sure we choose a few but key platforms and really leverage them to their maximum capabilities. So, for us, ServiceNow ultimately was not only a service management, but really how we maintained our governance in that area. We've got these two platforms now but how do we actually make them speak to each other? And 
I know Andre presented earlier today the numerous integrations available with Linux. One of them would be the ServiceNow integration. Since 2017, there were initial discussions on how best to integrate ServiceNow, that it was extremely custom and really not something that we as an organization were confident that we could support. In 2019, this conversation changed. Having recently announced the out-the-box ServiceNow integration, we started discussions to understand how do we take this opportunity with a clean slate or greenfield ServiceNow implementation and really look at working together on how do we bring this integration to life. And I can definitely tell you that the last thing we want to do is take something that we as a small architecture organization are going to have to support. But within several hours, not only did we have it up and running, we were able to configure it ourselves, and to date, I've had no issues with this. But what has been really beneficial is that it allows you to select what information you want to move between these two systems. So you're not only constrained to specific things like the application lifecycle, but all the other functionality in Linux, such as the tagging capabilities, can further enrich the information that you have within ServiceNow. And we'll look into that in a few slides as to how we've used those tags and information to further drive capabilities that are not only beneficial to the enterprise architecture function, but to our end users as a whole. On the other hand, we've got the Flexeria or Technopedia integration. Now, I don't know if any of you have looked at trying to source information or versions on all the different IT components you have. I'm pretty sure you're going to have to employ an army, maybe outsource it, because it is not going to be easy. And fundamentally, through this integration, it allows us to be able to, through an automated approach, get enriched information about all of our components. And fundamentally, without this, you will not be able to gain visibility using the technology and risk reporting, because some of the key attributes are populated, namely the version, the life cycle, i.e. the end of life, as well as the provider and standardization on the naming. So we've got the two platforms. They can speak to each other. But how do we decide which is the master? And I've had a few conversations with people that are starting this journey, and it really is a fundamental decision that you need to take. And it's not necessarily just about the platform that you're going to use, but it really is what type of organization do you have that is going to be able to support this, particularly when you have an organization or team mastering the application, the business capability, and the linkages between both. And then on the other hand, you need an organization to be able to look at all of your IT components and how do they link to those applications? Two completely different expertise, and not most of the time sitting in two completely different um, areas or functions of the organization. Probably architecture, probably service delivery. And as you see on the slide, this is really taken from Linux in terms of their proposed best practice. And through discussions with the team, it really was agreed that we would align to this proposal whereby business capabilities clearly sit within Linux. Applications, of course, are being maintained not by my team, but the center of expertise. And really, through Linux, which is going back to the Google or Facebook, simple UI that they see the benefit from and are enjoying the outputs from a reporting perspective, in contrast to asking them to work in service now, is just not a discussion that was even on the table. Now, on the other side, service now is strong at being a CMDB. It has numerous features in being able to discover assets, from automated probing to being able to add assets through certain import functionality, 
that as you start looking to the lower levels of the application stack, that is really where you want to manage the, your IT components. Now, for us, this was quite key going back to how the organization is placed because we actually then have, as part of our outsourcing, an entire team managing service management, namely one of them being the CMDB manager. And their key role is to make sure every CI or configuration item, which in Linux is an IT component, is clearly mapped to a business service. So for us, as the enterprise architecture team, we get to sit back, relax, and enjoy the technology risk report as the work is done offshore. So you've been able to get the two platforms integrated, and through that, discover a wealth of IT components. These have been able to be fed back into Linux, and now using your technology and risk report, you're able to look forward planning in terms of what are the risks you are going to see in your application space, and fundamentally feeding up discussions with your business around what key business capabilities do we need to take into consideration that could be impacted by these end of lives. But what other benefits are you going to start being able to have by integrating these two platforms? And what we started to, to see over the years and since 2017 is one of the key issues was always that applications had different names. Once in the business, maybe a center of expertise, and then within my team and as enterprise architecture. And fundamentally, this has been able to change that because not only do we have a master of applications in Linux, we've actually locked down service now to ensure that when we talk about an application, either to the service delivery team or to our camperistas, the end users, they see the same application name and the conversation becomes a lot more simpler because everyone is actually speaking the same language and we're not wasting time and causing more complexity. So what do we see here? So, and hopefully you can see it clearly. So on the incident side is, for the service delivery organization, raising tickets is their day job. But what information can we give to them that is actually going to drive more value and enable them to do that not only faster, but understand the potential risks to us as a business? So in ServiceNow, and one of the key things that we maintain is limited or zero customization, is the ability to choose your business service. So whilst raising that incident, they are now able to accurately select the application, having a clear conversation with the end user. And in doing so, they're able to understand what is the business criticality of that business service? What actually does that application do? And should I be routing it to a separate support team? As well as being able to drill down and see the business capabilities that this application is supporting. And linked to the SLAs is able for us to be able to start driving not only clear reporting, but actionable and timely incident management to mitigate potential risk and improve the experience for our end users. On the other side is the service request. So one of the key areas how our end users will engage with the ServiceNow portal is through service requests. And Mostly, what does a user want? They want application access. So once again, we've leveraged that integration to be able to expose the business services, our applications, to the end user. But it goes back into that conversation I had earlier in terms of how do you use tags and this integration to be able to drive more functionality? Now. I'm pretty sure if most of you look at your Linux, 90% of those applications, you probably don't want the end user to be able to select in terms of application access, or it's a lot more back end or back office. So we've used the tags to simplify what we expect the end user to be able to see, and thereby segregating what we would say the back office of service now to the front office. One of the ones that excites me most is actually the, 
way we're starting to look at how we drive application enhancements. Now, application enhancements, a simple request for change, driving potentially some value, but ultimately needing to be approved or reviewed by some type of super user, champion, business process owner. But when you look at some of the larger back office type in, uh, applications, such as the SAP stack, that could be supported by multiple BPOs and supports multiple capabilities. So how do we start routing those to the correct people? And this is where we started to introduce this conversation further around the business capability. So when the user is now choosing the application, they are then selecting what capability that they are having within the application to report or request that enhancement. Now, in the future, ideally, these two should swap around, and it's about what business capability am I looking to request an enhancement, and what applications do we have that are supporting that capability. But we've got some time to do in that area. Right, now when it comes to us in terms of enterprise architecture, what are some of the benefits that, that we are seeing? And I think one of the conversations I had in the last day is, we tend to be very good at IT as getting tools for ourselves that are going to supposedly help us capture information and gain insights, but how many of you have actually embedded that tool into a process. If I look at 2017 and 2018, we had Linux, it was great, we had these amazing reports, but how did we get people to put information in? Most of the time it was on our hands and knees, begging people, please, thank you, bribing, and they would put the information in. We're done with that. Now we embed it in a process, uh, so fundamentally, what we've looked to do is, through this integration with ServiceNow, is to actually make Linux a key part of our IT governance processes, all the way from the inception of an idea, moving through into the actual delivery of that. So how are we doing that? So the conversation really is about starting with demand management. And demand management is, I have an idea. I have an idea for an application. I have an idea to enable a business capability. And in doing so, one of the key things to actually progress is involving the wider team in terms of our center of expertise, validating that from a functional perspective. And then, of course, we need to look at how do we go through our architecture review board, where we're looking at all the different key components namely ensuring that we've taken into consideration everything that's going to drive the TCO, and fundamentally that we're not building out new capabilities or applications that we already have in our toolbox. So, as part of that demand, they are now able to select the specific application or applications that they are going to be able to progress. So, when we have the Architect Review Board, really the reports and service now are driving this discussion. Now, are we using and asking them to put information into service now that's going to be siloed? No. We are using Linux to capture further information and just through that integration expose that information to remove the, we'd say, burden on our center of expertise in terms of the workload they are having to do. Because prior to this, we had multiple PowerPoints, a few Excels, all trying to capture information to be presented. And the key part of what we're trying to do is not only maintain the information in the systems, but to remove the need for our teams to build that out in separate presentation layers. Now, moving from that demand, we're able to then move into what we look at as our portfolio review board. And fundamentally, this just follows the life cycle of an application within Linux. And through that integration, we're able to use the different life cycle attributes to determine where in service now this business service is now visible. So provided they are actually following this process flow, up until the point that we get to the CAB, or Change Advisory Board, 
Linux, the business service cannot be used to raise incidents, cannot be seen to be requested for application access or enhancements, but is there for them to work within the IT business management space. Now, ultimately, in, they've done it correctly within Linux. It will flow correctly through as active, and the day they go live post the cab, there they are now able to raise incidents, they can now access any of the service requests, all driven through the tags in the application. And fundamentally, this changes the begging and the pleading to, guys, you can actually now manage your portfolio and remove a lot of siloed interactions to be able to get your data into service now. And this is a lot of the feedback we're starting to get is starting to see huge benefits in the time it's taken and really hopefully driving further adoption of the Linux platform for us. Right. So just in closing, I think really being a small organization, we've really looked to try leverage platforms that minimize the effort on our teams really trying to automate as much as possible, not just on the gathering of data, but trying to move our conversation to the insights, to spend more time with our center of expertise in really trying to understand with them how we can build the roadmaps and get the capabilities of a forward-looking plan through the use of the IT components. I think over the next few years, really it's trying to understand then how further we can drive the business capability discussion with the business and really hopefully get to a point that that is really the first and foremost type of conversation that we're going to have. So uh, hopefully I've given you some insight into our journey uh, and we have a few minutes left if you have any questions. Of course, first of all, thank you very much, Matthew Zeidler. Thanks for being with us here at the EA Connect Days 2019 in Bonn. And of course, we're going to start with some questions. And sitting in row one, you should start. Yeah, thank you very much for your impressive speech here. Uh, I have one question. Did you do an integration between the Linux and the uh, ServiceNow for setting up these phases uh, as you go to for, for, for plan, transition, uh, and operations? Um, and you said you want to switch the phases. Is this done manually or, or by a board, or do you have a real integration unless the information is not keyed in, it can't be uh, yeah. followed up? So if you look at the integration with uh, and what Linux has built, is it's a very simple end user way of configuring uh, different filters and deciding which specific attributes, be it tags or custom fields, you want to be exposed or interfaced to service now. So it's really, as simple as what I would think of customizing a basic, um, I'm not trying to think of a platform, uh, front end service now where you don't necessarily need to go down to the coding level. And just through the filters and the different phases on the Linux application, you can then convert those to what that means within service now. So it could be active within Linux, but of course, service now has a very different naming convention. Doing that, it will be able to convert that at that point in time. And the same goes for business criticality, functional fit, et cetera. You can map those to the correct service now attributes. And I, I think this is quite key because we have come from a service now that is extremely bespoke and customized to we will maintain as much vanilla as possible. And this was one of the conversations we had continually with the Linux team was to minimize any change within the service now side. Any more questions that want to be answered by Matthew Zeidler right now? Of course, there you go. Um, thanks, Matthew. It was very, very interesting. Um, are you also running agile projects with this setup? Interesting. <laughs> so and I had this conversation last night actually with Andrea somewhere. Um, so personal view, Campari as a business, we are not mature enough yet to, to be full Agile. Right now, Agile for us is really, I'd say, an excuse for not having requirements. However, we do have 
platforms that could support that, a lot more of the SaaS areas that we're moving into, and we are considerate of that. And if you look at ServiceNow IT business management, you have two types of flows there. You do have the original sort of waterfall-based approach. We are currently redesigning our processes around the project management aspect, and we have a what we call a fast-track approach, which would be more agile. But I think until the business is ready to work in that manner, we as IT will just focus on actually just improving the way we manage our, our assets and architecture. <laughs> no, it's yeah. not you. It's <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, impressive your journey. Uh, sounds like a great success. I would like to, to, to get an idea what your biggest challenge has been when it comes to integrating ServiceNow. Because I think many here have the feeling that it's not as easy as it might be. So, uh, you know what? If we were using our original service now, and I, I have to say, I think this is probably the fear for everyone in this room that has an existing <laughs> instance, it is not easy. Um, a lot of the time, you've customized it, it's highly bespoke, and it's very hard, depending on who manages or is the product owner for your service now, to change that conversation as to who should be the application master. So, unfortunately, I, I can't say we had really any issues because we truly sat down and looked and said, are we going to be able to deliver a, a fundamental transformation to our end users and internal IT on our current service now? Or are we better re-architecting everything from scratch with the target of what we're trying to achieve? And net-net, we decided to rebuild the service now from scratch. So it was a lot more work, probably. Um, however, in the shorter term, from an integration aspect, as I said, I think we had the Linux team over for less than half a day. And within the first two or three hours, we had actually completed and we sent them off to Milan for a spritz. Um, so, we still have some minutes left to ask more questions. There you go. Hi, David speaking. Um, how do you ensure that during the introduction of a new demand, um, the necessary mandatory information is being documented so that if you continue in service now, uh, you have all the basic information to continue with the following workflows. So it's actually relatively simple in service now, and I think that's one of the, I'd say, the key areas where you can look at sort of fully customizing versus just simple configuration in the workflows. And as I said, we wanted to make sure information where it was re relevant to the application, it remained and was always maintained in Linux to continue its life cycle and provide value back to us as sort of the architecture function. So we do expose that information through the same integration where we've mapped fields, but it is only read-only within ServiceNow to really enable the center of expertise as they select their application to see what information do they have, and if there's certain attributes or information missing, it will not let them progress into that workflow. So a good example being, I'm going to plan a new system for 2020. If I just create that without any information, I don't know if it's on-premise, on cloud, SaaS, et cetera, fundamentally, they will be able to see what is required in the ServiceNow side and actually go back and complete that into Linux. I'm calling in for one more question, if you feel free to ask. Use the chance and the time to ask Matthew. But I guess probably, yeah, OK, sorry. Um, yeah, thanks for the very interesting presentation. Uh, one question, uh, you've set up quite an ambitious information system to describe your IT, at least that's my understanding. Uh, can you give us an example of a decision you have been able to support with this system? In terms of the rationalization of capabilities or through demand in terms of architecture review boards? Yeah, for example, of an architecture decision uh, where you have been using this up-to-date information 
to better support the decision? So I think a few areas. So I mean, as a whole, our architecture review board has the authority to actually stop applications. Um, we've done that on numerous occasions. Um, fundamentally, it is what we would say the highest power within our IT organization. But when it comes to the likes of um, new demand, et cetera, and being able to do that, I think really key things that we've come out with is being able to ensure the total cost of ownership is correct. A lot of the times our center of expertise, and it's a pitfall that we have today is as much as we've moved from a service orientated to more of a business partnership type organization, we tend to have a lot more business analysts versus solution architects, which means we don't necessarily have a very good depth of um, understanding when it comes to architecture in the wider circles. So the architecture review board tends to capture a lot of this and being able to ensure we've taken into consideration other aspects, be it security, be it integration, that could be either a pitfall for us or a, a significant cost. And that has then driven different discussions at the further boards when we look at more of the portfolio and where we're investing. Happy to chat more afterwards. Yeah, that was my idea too, because you're working with Campari Group, so I probably guess you might stay for some drinks later on. So if you have the chance to grab him at the bar, enjoy some uh, Campari and uh, some more chatting, get together. Matthew Zeidler, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.